All right, welcome back to our podcast. This is your host, Jason Lee. And today I've got Avery Carr with me. She is the CEO and founder of a short term shop. She is a vacation rental, AKA short term rental expert. And I'm very excited to have her on today. Avery, how are you doing? Hey, I'm awesome. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to have you. I'm glad our mutual connection, Steve, connected us. And yeah, let's get right into it. How did you get into real estate? I kind of backed into real estate. I don't think anybody says I want to be a real estate agent or I want to be a real estate investor when I grow up. Um, so long story short, my husband and I were moving to Nashville from New York City back in 2012, 2013. And our real estate agent at the time was really trying to get us to buy in this super hip, fast appreciating area of Nashville. And we were like, no, 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 we're moving from Brooklyn to Tennessee. We want to buy out in the country. We don't want any more neighbors. So we bought something out in the country, but then we thought, man, that might be, there might be something to that buying the property and, uh, you know, we'll rent it out and it'll pay for itself. So we're not coming out of pocket. And then, you know, in 20 years when our future kids need to go to college, we can just sell it and it'll pay for their college out of the appreciation, which was a stupid reason to buy a piece of property, but we did. Luckily it cash flowed really well. Um, and it was making just under a thousand dollars over the mortgage every month, which at my, you know, I had an MBA and was working in the music business in Nashville for basically nothing. And uh, my paycheck every month after all of the deductions and things was about $1,000 a month. So we almost doubled my income with one long-term rental. So then we said, well, this is something we need more of. How do we build a business out of this? So only then did we start listening to podcasts and reading books and educating ourselves on uh, real estate investing. And uh, we only had enough money for one down payment on a single family home left. And we said, well, what can we buy that's going to make us the most amount of money the fastest so that we can buy more of these faster? And we said, well, oh, how about a short-term rental? But we didn't want to do it in Nashville because the regulations were really, really volatile. They're pretty anti-short-term rental there. And we said, well, where can we buy something that is just the normal thing for people to not stay in a hotel and to stay in like a house or a condo? So we landed on the Smoky Mountains about three hours east, four hours east of Nashville, We'd just been on vacation there. We stayed in a cabin. Everybody else was staying in a cabin. And we figured somebody owns these cabins. Why can't that be us? And that's kind of, that's how it, how it started anyway. Very cool. Very cool. What did you say you wanted to be before you uh, got into real estate? So I worked on the business side of the music business. Before that, uh, I w wanted to be a rock star. Um, I... <laughs> graduated from undergrad from University of Texas in 2009, which was the worst time in history for a soft major such as myself in communications to graduate and be able to get a job. So I'd been playing in bands and touring in bands all through college. So I just said, okay, well, I'll do this for a while, take a little time and bartended and toured in bands for four or five years until the economy swung back around and I decided to go back, get my MBA and start working on the, on the business side of music. So I wanted to be a rock star before this. Wow. Now you're a, uh, now you're a real estate rock star. <laughs> it's, yeah, I guess so. It's funny, <laughs> funny how things happen. That's funny. Yeah. It's just your personality, I guess. And then, so how did you t tell us more about your first property? Like how did you save up enough money to get into it? And how did the first deal go? Cause that's where usually where most mistakes are made. So tell us more about that. So we kind of did things the opposite of most people. So rather than doing all the research and, and educating ourselves and agonizing over the decision and learning the rules and the percentages and things, and, and then buying a property, we just went and bought a property and then learned how to do it. So that could have gone really, really bad. Um, we got very lucky on our first deal because it was right on the MLS and the agent, so her parents had owned the property since it was built like in the 80s. And she just got a real estate license. She was really young. And of course, her parents hired her to list their house. And she left it up for about 24 hours with no pictures. And she also did not properly price it. She underpriced it pretty hard. So it was something that should have had multiple offers. And we went in, It had. No, we happened to live, uh, well, we were passing by that area. And we said, oh, 
this property just hit the market. There's no pictures. And we drove by and we were like, man, this is actually a nice house. So we got in there and looked at it the first day and just made a full price offer because it was so ready to go. Didn't need anything, did not need any work. And um, so we were able to get it just because of that agent's inexperience. And um, we didn't know that there was, you know, the 1% rule where you're supposed to be able to, to rent a single family long-term for 1% of the purchase price per month. We just happened to buy a really good deal. So we got really lucky. I don't necessarily recommend doing it that way, but by doing it that way, we didn't get in the analysis paralysis phase. We like just ripped that bandaid right from the get-go. And so we've never really gotten into that phase again, because I think a lot of people who start investing in real estate, there's just so much content and so much information out there now that they can get overwhelmed by it and then never do anything. So we, by just firing before aiming, just skip that, that part altogether. That, that's, that's how I am too. I kind of just go for it and hope it, hope it goes well. Um, there are pros and cons. Like you said, you kind of just go for it and you skip that stage, but luckily for you, it worked out, but that had all like the characteristics of a great deal. It was mismarketed, new agent, underpriced, no photos. That's like the worst thing you can do as a, as a new listing coming on the market. So kudos to you. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. And then what was your second deal? Second deal was our first short-term rental in the Smoky Mountains. So back then, uh, short-term rental investing, so this was 2015, was not a real, quote, real asset class yet. There weren't all these people doing it. Uh, there were no gurus. There were no courses. There was no content, no influencers. So we just kind of had to figure out how to do it. So um, we just started looking and we said we knew we wanted it to be a cabin because that's what people stay in there. You know, we knew it, it couldn't be like a brick ranch house or something that wasn't going to work. So we just focused on looking at cabins in the price range that we could afford. And um, we were able to get a good deal on the one that we got because uh, most of the cabins out there have been vacation rentals since, you know, since they were built, whether that was in the early 2000s or the early 60s. Uh, they've all been short-term rentals. So we found one that was really cute, had all the right characteristics architecturally, but it had been a long-term rental and, and a very... Uh, it was a real, the rent was not anywhere near market rent on it. And the renter was really messy. And like, I mean, I don't think they swept the entire four or five times, five, four or five years that they lived there. So it did not show well at all. There were other things that were maybe just a little bit more expensive that were more ready to go. And so we kind of saw the potential in this one of like, Hey, you know, all we need to do is get rid of this ugly furniture and give this thing a good cleanup and it will be a really great property. So uh, we were able to get a good deal on that one and we just kind of had to figure it out as we went. So back then the property management standard split in that market for short terms was 40% of your gross. And we were like, well, we can't do that. We need that 40% so we can buy more properties. So we kind of pieced together how to self-manage that property from Nashville uh, without the use of a property manager. And I mean, there's all kinds of content out there now, mine included, about how to do that. But back then we were just kind of shooting in the dark a little bit. And luckily we were really successful. Wow. And now, <clears throat> before we started recording, you you told me that you have 250 units, right? Around. Mm -hmm. And how did you go from those two deals to owning that many units? So because... so. I'll give you an example. So because our first one, our first single family long-term was our highest cash flowing long-term that we've ever had. Uh, so that one's a little bit of an outlier. Most of our other long-terms make about 500 bucks a month. And so when we, after we saw how much money we were making a month on our sh first short term, which was more like $4,000 a month, we said, oh, we need more of these so that we can get into apartment buildings so that we can get, you know, more high volume, single family, long term. So our goal was never to have like a thousand short terms, which it's fine if that's what you want to do. Our goal was to get enough short terms to generate enough cash flow where we didn't have to worry about saving up a down payment every time where we just had a nest egg to go invest in more real estate. So um, we were able to scale that one short term rental in the Smokies to five in the Smokies over the course of about the next 18 months. 
And then we've been able to get into all of these. So we only have eight short-term rentals. We got to eight. That's enough to generate the cash flow that we need to go buy apartment buildings. So um, we've just kind of, we slowly started adding in some long-term duplexes and some long-term single families. And then about two years ago, we started buying so many of those that we were like, man, we're having like 10 closings in a day on these single family long-terms. Maybe we should just get into apartment buildings now and have 10 units, but one closing. So we started buying 10 to 12 unit apartment buildings. And then now we have a few uh, that are between like 20 and 50 units. So we just kind of, the, the main takeaway here in this entire story is don't spend any of the money that you make on real estate on anything other than buying more real estate. And that's how you scale. Reinvest it all. Yeah. That's what you did. Fantastic. And um, what areas are you buying uh, apartment buildings at? Um, so the Southeast and the Midwest just kind of depends where the deals are. Yeah. I'm actually now uh, on the panhandle of Florida in an area called 30A between Destin and Panama City. Got it. So almost all your properties are out of state then, technically, for you. Yeah. So I own the house that I live in and three investment properties in Florida and everything else is out of state. Got it. For the listener that, because I, I, I get this question a good amount, for the listener that's wondering how to start investing out of state or how to manage properties out of state, how do you do so? I would tell you to start with a book called Long Distance Real Estate Investing by David Green of Bigger Pockets. Um, there, it's really no different than investing in the same town that you live in. It's just a mindset shift. So I tell people, if a toilet breaks in my house in Tennessee, I'm going to do the exact same thing as if a toilet breaks in my office five feet behind me, I'm going to call somebody because I don't fix toilets. I don't know how to fix a toilet. So I'm calling somebody no matter what. It's just getting used to, okay, I'm calling somebody 500 miles away instead of calling somebody 10 miles away. Um, so it's really just nobody, not everyone can live in the best place to invest, whether it's long-term, short-term, whatever. So it's really easy to just kind of scoot somewhere else and do it remotely. Uh, so I definitely recommend long distance real estate investing to get started with that. Nice. And do you self-manage or do you have property managers in each state? For all of our short terms, we self-manage. If you are really trying to scale the way that we have a property manager taking 20% on a short term of your gross, not your net, is probably not going to be the person to get you there. To get that, to give you a little context on that, if we'd paid a property manager last year for our eight short terms, we would have paid him between 200 and 250,000. And I can think of a lot better things to do with that. Um, and you can do it all from your phone. There's lots of tools to automate things now, but for our long-term rentals, we do have property managers in each city. Got it. Got it. That's interesting. I mean, I'm in San Diego. If you had eight short-term rentals making four grand a month, it'd be tough to buy the amount of properties you did. So you're probably buying in a lot lower value markets. Like a 10 unit apartment building that you're buying is probably like a hundred, 150 K somewhere around there. No, <laughs> over a million for sure. Uh, so oh, really? Yeah. But so let me add a little context to that. So that back then when we first started buying those first two properties, so those were our first three properties were two, two beds and a one bed. Um, the first year we had those, the two beds made about 45,000 each and the one bed made about 25,000. Now, because we've been on the platforms for so long and we've renovated and we have a lot of really good reviews, those same three properties last year, those two bedrooms made 80,000 each and the, the one bed made just under 70,000. So um, the, they've made a lot. Term? Yeah, for short term. So got it, got it. they've made a lot more since then. And then we also have some bigger ones. So we've got, now we've got bigger properties uh, in our short-term portfolio that we started buying, you know, once we were able to that make a lot more. So, uh, I mean, it's really easy for some of our beach properties in the summertime. And I mean, this is not all 12 months of the year because beach properties are seasonal to like have no problem clearing 10, 15,000 a month. So um, just depends on the market, depends on the property. But uh, yeah, the I would say the cheapest apartment building we've ever bought was I think 750 and that was a 12 unit. That's really cheap. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
that in San Diego is like at least four million. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, as somebody that lives in San Diego would be a great candidate to uh, <laughs> invest out of state. For sure. Yeah. Yeah, my brother lives in San Diego, and it's it's nuts in terms of prices. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's there's good deals out here, but it's definitely very few and far between. It's tough, yeah. tough to find a good deal. I hope you're enjoying the show. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen. I hope you're getting value out of it. If you don't mind doing me a quick favor, if you could leave me a five-star review and subscribe to my channel or the podcast, I would greatly appreciate it. I'm trying to reach more amazing people like yourself on the world of real estate so that you can get out of the system and live the passive income lifestyle and do what you want, whenever you want. So if you could share this video with your friends, whether it's whether you're watching on YouTube or sharing the podcast link, I greatly appreciate it. If you can help grow the show so I can reach more amazing people, that would be wonderful. Thank you so much. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the show. What's been, so you've been doing this for how long? I started investing in 2015. Okay, cool. And did you, have you taken advantage of 1031 exchanges or cash out refinances more to kind of grow your portfolio? Or was it all just through the income you made through short-term rentals? I have done one 1031 exchange and I've done one HELOC on a primary home. We did that to buy our third property, but I've never actually cash out refined any of our properties. Wow. That's yeah. very interesting. <laughs> very interesting. Is there a reason why? So, uh, we've had enough cash flow, and I mean, we're obviously still like using cash flow from our actual jobs. Um, mine running the brokerage, and then my husband uh, is well, he's only part time now, but he is a rock DJ on Sirius XM. So, uh, we still have income from other places. So, we're using all of the income from our properties plus, you know, anything extra we have to roll into. Uh, more real estate. Then I think I totally missed the question and now I've forgotten what it was because I went on a tangent. Sorry. <laughs> no, you answered it. You answered it. Okay. That's awesome. Yeah. And then, and then when did you, when did you start your brokerage with EXP, the short-term shop? Uh, I started that in 2018. So I got my license at the end of 2016, really just to do our own deals. Cause there weren't really any agents in the space who could answer our questions about like, how much do you think this property will make? Or how do I find a cleaner? So I just bridged that gap, got my license and became that agent. And, um, so it just kind of started with, I, I wasn't actually planning to help anybody but us. And, um, then our friends started saying, how much are you making on that cabin? Help me find one, teach me how to, how to do that. So I started doing that and then it started being friends of friends. And then it started being people that I truly didn't know. And uh, just kind of grew from there. Now we've got 70 agents in 15 markets. So it's definitely grown a lot, but all short-term rentals, nothing else. Wow. And what are some of the markets that you're in? Okay. So we're, we stick to typically regional drivable vacation markets. Uh, so we're in the Smoky Mountains in Tennessee. We are in two mountain markets in North Carolina and the Western North Carolina mountains. So the North Carolina Smokies, the high country in North Carolina, we're in Outer Banks, North Carolina, Carolina Beach, North Carolina, Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, Blue Ridge, Georgia, Gulf Shores, Alabama, Galveston and Crystal Beach, Texas, the hill country of Texas, Broken Bow, Oklahoma. Uh, we are in the Emerald Coast of Florida, which is on the Panhandle. So Destin, Panama City, 30A area. Forgotten Coast of Florida, we're outside Orlando in what we call the Disney market, and we're opening up Branson this week in Missouri and Shenandoah, Virginia. Oh, and uh, we're also in Scottsdale, Arizona. That's amazing. How did you, <laughs> how, how are we able to penetrate into so many different markets? So most of our clients buy several properties. So if they say, Oh, you know, we're, if I hear enough people say, oh, you know, we're interested in buying in such and such market, do you have an agent there? If I don't have an agent there, I go get an agent there because if a few of them are asking about it, then there's plenty more of them that haven't asked and they're just going to buy. So um, it's, it's not terribly, it, it's 
it's really difficult. The most difficult part is finding the right agents to work for us because it's a very different mindset doing what we do than selling primary homes. So that's the hardest part is finding the right agents. Got it. Got it. And do you have offices in all, all those locations or is it remote? Remote. Got it. Yeah. Cause it's EXP, right? Yeah. So yeah. cloud based, right? Yeah. That's good though. You have no, you have barely any overhead then, right? Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've got an office here, our main office in Florida, but everything else is remote. Got it. Very cool. What do you think is the market you're most active in? Uh, the Smokies, since that was our first one, is definitely the biggest. And it's definitely the one that has uh, skyrocketed in popularity the most since we started. Uh, I could not have predicted that. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. So I have to ask you, because I feel like there's a new Airbnb rental expert that comes out of Instagram mm -hmm. every single day. Why is that? Why are there so many wannabe gurus out there in your space? They were all my clients, almost every single one of them. I taught almost every single one of them. My husband, so my husband teaches our education part about management and I, nine out of 10 of those people are our clients or were. Um, and I think everybody, everybody wants to be an influencer these days, not just in the real estate space. So, you know, everybody's just looking for that thing that they can be the influ try to be an influencer in. Um, and it, it annoys me to death, to be honest. <laughs> Why does it annoy you? Uh, because they're competing um, against you? What? Because they're competing against you? No, no. It annoys me to death because, uh, you know, people will buy like one property and then go try to tell people how to do stuff when they haven't even been through an entire year of market cycles yet. So it's, it's actually a little bit dangerous uh, depending on how big of an audience they get. You know, there's a few of them out there that are, that are really great. Um, they're really great at what they do. Like Brian page for one, I don't do arbitrage, but you know, he is the expert in arbitrage. So I think there's a difference between an expert and an influencer. And I think it's important for people to kind of distinguish between the two and look at track record and longevity. Like how long has this person been doing it, uh, before they just, you know, blindly follow, because there's a lot that can be like, I mean, in the, better part of a decade that I've been doing this. I've made all the mistakes. I've seen not all the things, but the vast majority of the things. And I can um, attest to, you know, it's sometimes it's better to learn what not to do than exactly what to do. And um, I think it's really important to kind of make that distinction when it comes to influencers in any space. It's not just the real estate space. They're out there in, in everything, you know, drop shipping or fashion or whatever. That's the worst one. Dropshipping is the worst one. I remember when I was in college, I got, I got caught by one of those scammers. So funny. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, there's, I, I, I couldn't agree more. There's a lot of people out there that'll buy one or two deals that are in my space too. I'm in multifamily, but they'll buy a deal, they'll buy a fourplex, and then they'll start making a course on how to buy a fourplex. And it's just, it's really hilarious to me. It's pretty yeah. ridiculous. Well, your space is everybody wants to be a syndicator. I know, I know, I know. It, 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 it's it's hilarious. Yeah. But a lot of those people are, are losing their asses right now. There's I know a lot of people that are that are not doing so hot because debt's coming due, rates yeah. are still skyrocketing. So it's not a good time for most people. Yeah, it's rough out there. It's rough out there. Are are you seeing anything negative? I mean, I mean this is kind of a tough question, but are you seeing are you seeing a big slowdown in your space? Um, yeah, well, yeah, so we're seeing a big slowdown a because there's not as many people uh, in the game in terms of being buyers right now, uh, the interest rates have kind of kicked out like weeded out a lot of the weaker hands. So it's a really good time to be a buyer because you're able to get better deals, but then you do have to deal with the higher interest rates. So you have to just make sure that the deals work at the rate you're able to get it. Um, in terms of actual rentals, so a lot of people who bought in 2020 and 2021 got a little bit spoiled by the not normal travel activity of that time. And, you know, during that time, you could buy anything. You could buy a house that probably I wouldn't necessarily recommend, like something that doesn't really work, something kind of marginal, maybe a little too far out and slap it on Airbnb and never pay attention to it and make a ton of money. And now that it's kind of normalized, a lot of those people are like, hey, I'm not getting booked because 
they're used to not going in and tweaking things. They're used to not really managing things when really, you know, it's a system and you have to manage it just like anything else. So I think a lot of those people are having problems or people who bought things that probably wouldn't work as well in a normal market, but they worked fine during that time. Those are, those are the people that are really kind of seeing, uh, feeling the pinch there. Got it. Got it. Yeah. I mean, people were spoiled and I feel like in many industries, 2020, 2021, early 2022. So that makes sense. Are you, are you seeing, I know, I know a big rebuttal that people have against short-term rentals is that, you know, when times get bad, when the recession happens, which is happening, people aren't traveling, people aren't spending money. Are you, are you a firm believer that some markets for short-term rentals are just recession proof and will always have demand for, uh, for, not renters, but vacationers. Yeah. So nothing I would, nothing's recession proof, but there are some air, the t some types of markets that are more recession resistant than others. So I like to stick to regional drivable vacation destinations because they're both affordable and accessible. So, you know, in 2020, people weren't necessarily flying to Mexico to go to the beach anymore, but they could drive to Panama city or drive to the outer banks. Uh, and, that it's accessible. They didn't want to get on a plane and be breathed on by people and get sick. So they stayed in control of their own environment and drove in a, uh, an economic downturn that's more financially driven. Well, they're probably not spending the money to fly to Mexico to go to the beach, but it is cheaper to just drive to something, you know, this five to eight hours away. So I like those kinds of markets that are really heavy tourism markets. You know, Myrtle beach is another one, um, where, there's always going to be tourist demand, whether it's good or bad. And I think the ones that really get hit hard are the big expensive vacations. So like, you know, the big ski destinations like Jackson Hole or Hawaii, places where you have to save up all year to go to one of those places and, and you spend a lot of money doing it. Uh, I think those are the places that get hit the worst in a downturn. So I like to stick to those regional drivable, uh, mature vacation markets. So you stay away from like the high end expensive um, save up money all year kind of markets, like you said. Yeah. Yeah. For now. And I might at some point get like a, what I would call like a lifestyle investment in somewhere like that. Maybe we want to buy something in Telluride. I don't even know what their, their regulations are, but that's just an example where it's something that I would like to have and the expenses, I mean, sorry. And the income from it can at least put a dent in its expenses or pay for itself. But in terms of purely cash flow, I'm probably not going to go uh, super high end on anything. Gotcha. Gotcha. Makes sense. One thing I've been seeing, uh, in California at least, and some other parts of the West coast is people are starting to crack down, not people, cities are starting to crack down on the amount of short-term rentals that can be in a certain location. You got to have permits and stuff. Now, are you seeing that in your side of the world? So in most of the markets that we're in, it's been all short-term rentals since forever. Like Destin, Florida, where I live, my grandmother's been coming and renting short-term rentals here since 1937. So these oh, wow. are areas where that, that battle was fought a long time ago. Um, and there are regulations like, you know, ways you have to register with the city, taxes and things like that. Um, so that's kind of why I stay out of metro markets. I learned my lesson uh, in Nashville with that, not by actually investing there, but just by watching other people do it and realizing this is not something I really want to play around with, with changing regulations. Uh, so in the markets that we're in, uh, that's not really something that we have to be too concerned about. That's good to know, though, because I feel like a lot of people probably don't know that. I mean, Destin, Florida, is, since 1937, it's been happening. That's, that's amazing. So. Yeah. Um, I, I do know a lot of Metro cities are cracking down, but you're in markets where it's been a vacation city. So you're doing great. That's yeah. awesome. Cool. Well, Avery, it's been a fantastic show so far before I ask a couple last questions before we go, how can the listener connect with you and learn more about you? Yeah. So best thing to do is follow us on Instagram. It's at the short term shop. So we make any, uh, or TikTok at the short term shop. Uh, but we make you know, any announcements or education tools, things like that will be on Instagram. So follow us there. Fantastic. And why is real estate your favorite type of investment out there? 
because it can't be picked up and carried away. It cannot have a, you know, a bank crisis isn't going to disappear the entire uh, amount of the equity like it would my entire deposit in a bank. And uh, it trends upward. So, you know, there might be some blips here and there. It might go up and down a little bit, but over the long run, it trends upward and really can't beat the cash flow. Amazing. Couldn't have said it better. <laughs> and then last question before we go, what were some challenges, some hurdles you had to overcome on your journey to financial freedom and where you got to today? Mainly just the, the, the saving up for that first one is the hardest. It's the saving of the down payments. That is the true hard part. So if you can budget really well and get yourself, uh, you know, get, create a plan uh, with benchmarks, you know, daily, weekly, monthly benchmarks. So I mean, my daily one was, I'm not going to spend more than $20 a day, period. And uh, my husband and I were on that $20 a day budget for two years to save up for our first one. So um, just definitely set a plan and stick to it. Awesome stuff. Avery, thanks so much for coming on. You are a fantastic guest and I hope a ton of people reach out to you because you're a wealth of knowledge. And again, thanks for coming on, Avery. Appreciate your time. Yeah, thanks for having me.